18 months earlier, he'd collapsed. He'd gone to a state hospital. He'd been given dialysis treatment to stabilize him. And at the end of the treatment, the hospital said, we only have 17 machines to cover a very big population area. And we have hundreds of patients presenting themselves. We can only manage to give prolonged dialysis treatment to 30% based on the machines and the technicians available. And we give priority to people whose health indicates that they would benefit from renal transplants. And you, Mr. Subramani, are suffering from ischemic heart disease, uh, blood sugar problems, and you don't fall within that 30%. So his family collected what money they could. They went to a private clinic and it kept him alive. The quality of life wasn't all that good, but he was functioning until eventually their family resources were completely exhausted. And there was no prospect of recovery. This would be an endless financial burden on them he went back to the state hospital and said, my family cannot continue to pay the private clinic. And I am claiming my constitutional right of access to health care guaranteed in the Constitution and another provision in the Constitution which says no one shall be deprived of emergency health care. The case came very rapidly to the Constitutional Court. And it was, as you can imagine, an extremely poignant case. He was dying. And we knew that quite literally our decision could prolong his life or consign him to an early death. The unfortunate aspect of that in terms of jurisprudence is that you're under great pressure to produce uh, an outcome quickly, one way or the other. There's no point in writing a beautiful judgment if he's already died, if the judgment should go in his favor. It was the first case we had in terms of enforcing social and economic rights in South Africa. It had been in our final constitution for about two years. And I think for all of us on the court, emotionally it was an exceptionally difficult case to handle, but technically from a jurisprudential point of view, one's immediate total intuitive response, and by intuitive I mean an intuition that's been shaped over years of fighting for human rights, helping to draft the constitution of people steeped in this area was that the medical authorities had applied constitutionally appropriate criteria. They were medical criteria. And that it wasn't for us as a court to go behind their decision uh, and to say that we know better than you do find a machine for him. And also, it wasn't for us to try and put pressure on them to, because this chap had come to us, he's dying, uh, can't you find somebody to work overtime, somebody to do something? That's not a principle basis. That's simply responding to the emotion of the situation and avoiding the hard constitutional issue. The court unanimously decided that the judicial application of fundamental rights to social and economic rights as set out in our Constitution was something 
required, it was part of the duty of the courts. But given the massive homelessness in our country, the scale of illness, the disproportionate way in which people had access to medical treatment, uh, to water, to electricity, to social security, the problems facing the country were immense, they were enormous. And these rights would have a hollow ring until the country was really in a position to respond to the promise given by the Constitution. Nevertheless, we had that particular case before us. And Arthur Chaskelson, the president of the court, who went on to be called the Chief Justice, stated that, and with the support of all the judges, that the criteria used by the medical authorities were rational, they could not be said to be unfair, and the Mr. Subramani couldn't claim that his constitutional rights were being violated. I signed on to that, but I wanted to add some extra thoughts that I had on the whole question of the nature of social and economic rights. Because during the argument, uh, counsel had suggested that the Constitution says everyone shall have the right of access to health care. The state shall take reasonable legislative and other measures progressively to realize the right. The council had suggested that the restriction of the right to 70% of the people uh, mm -hmm. suffering from renal failure represented a limitation on the enjoyment of the right. And limitations in terms of our Bill of Rights have to be justified by the state as being reasonable and justifiable in an open democratic society. And the argument was it is reasonable and justifiable in an open democratic society. I had problems with that way of formulating the issue. To my mind, the fact that resources played an intrinsic role in the capacity to exercise the right was not a limitation on the enjoyment of the right that had to be justified by the state, but was intrinsic to the very nature of the right. If we call them first generation, second generation rights, I do so not to suggest that second generation means a second class. It's just historically they came onto the scene at a later stage. And in our debates to get these rights included in the text of the Constitution as justiciable rights and not just programmatic, we developed the argument that we were fighting for freedom with bread and for bread with freedom. We didn't want freedom without bread. We didn't want bread without freedom. Each was intricately bound up with the enjoyment of the other. But the claims for freedom are not ordinarily conceptually rationed. My right to vote is a complete right to vote, and everybody else who's qualified has the right to vote. My right to speak my mind, to associate with others, these are unqualified, unrestricted rights by their very nature. There might be problems about access to limited broadcasting waves, uh, monopolies that limit the actual, in practice, freedom to exercise these rights. But in principle, there's an autonomous foundation to, that anchors these rights in the individual who's claiming the rights, even if they're always exercised in the community, community setting. The right of access to health care, on the other hand, is a right which by its nature 
competes with other people in similar situations because there's never enough funding, even in the most developed societies, even in the richest societies. Uh, the claims of, on medical science, the claims for the other fundamental rights constantly expand. There's no limited horizon. And the rights are based not so much on a notion of autonomy, but a notion of interdependence. And that the person claiming the right of access to this very expensive dialysis machine, expensive to buy, but also very expensive to operate, has to understand there are other people in the queue, and also that this machine is soaking up uh, portions of the budget that could otherwise go to other people suffering from terminal illnesses, other chronic illnesses, but also to mother and child care, which is primary, to immunization programs, to programs to change lifestyles, uh, behavior, and all the other areas that form a composite part of the adequate, appropriate health program. And that should be built into the understanding and conceptualization of the nature of the right, and not seen as some kind of limitation that the state has to justify. In other words, it's rationing. And in the judgment, which is quoted in the chapter in, uh, in the book, which has been uh, given to each one of you, I actually use the word rationing. And I think one should be upfront about that. One doesn't like the idea of rationing freedom rights, rationing vot voting rights. And it might look as though the state is simply using the concept of rationing to deny people rights to which otherwise they'd be entitled because of shortages. But rationing should be explained in terms of using appropriate medical and social and humanitarian criteria for the distribution. And it's those criteria that are subject to constitutional control. In the case of Mr. Subramani, we accepted in argument that this was not a case of an emergency. He was chronically ill. The emergency was his initial collapse. He did get state treatment, and so he didn't qualify under that provision. And when it came to the access to the uh, expensive dialysis machinery, uh, he had to acknowledge, as a person claiming the right, that there were other people with desperate claims on a very stretched health budget in our country, and provided he was given a fair access to the criteria, and these were medical criteria, that he wasn't being excluded on constitutionally invalid grounds, that he had no constitutional complaint. What would be a constitutionally invalid ground if the argument was discriminatory on the basis of race or gender, clearly it would be. A more difficult one would be on the grounds of age. And one might say people under a certain age who have a longer lifespan ahead of them uh, should have greater access. I don't know, that would be a difficult, a difficult case. Uh, the fact that you are supremely intelligent, a brilliant engineer, the country desperately needs engineers, to my mind would not be a medically appropriate criterion for access. This is one of those areas where the equality principle uh, is tested to its utmost. We weren't popular with the press, we weren't popular with the human rights community. And three days after our judgment, Mr. Subramani died. There was quite a powerful public reaction against the court. And I remember one law clerk saying, 
oh, you could have found some machine somewhere. When we take the oath to do justice to all without fear, favor, or prejudice, that's usually seen as without fear, favor, or prejudice in relation to the state, to powerful economic interests, to pressure groups. But sometimes the most difficult cases without fear, favor, or prejudice are cases where the human rights community is involved, where people with your own background and interests and so on are involved. Uh, and it does impose, we found, a, a rigorous uh, intellectual, in the broad sense, not formalistic, but constitutional uh, imagination process to ensure that you're producing a principled kind of an outcome. I, I can recall so vividly counsel for Mr. Subramani. He was almost shaking when he was arguing with us. It reminded me of my days at the bar myself, pleading for people facing death sentences with that terrible burden. If I mess up the argument, my client is going to die. And, and I actually said to him from the bench, uh, I, I praised him for the fair manner in which he'd raised the issues without denying that other people in similar circumstances had equal claims that had to be considered. And I said that if resources were coexistent with compassion, this case would be very easy to decide, but they're not. About a year later, we had a case that dealt with people being evicted from their very rough shelters and another social economic right had to be considered by our court. It's Mrs. Grootboom. Uh, the name actually means big tree. And she was one of about a thousand people, maybe 400 of whom were children, who had moved from a very impoverished shantytown area self-made constructions crammed together because the winter rains were approaching in South Africa and she couldn't bear the idea of having a waterlogged winter, the children going out of the little shack to splash in the water and they moved, they took, they dismantled their simple homes and moved to a nearby hillside that had drainage, natural drainage. Only to discover that that hillside had been set aside for formal housing and the state was going to build houses for people from that community of 10,000 and this thousand were very low down on the list. And so eventually after mediation had been tried, it failed, they were evicted. Very roughly evicted. And they couldn't go back to where they'd been living before because other people had occupied those areas and they moved to a sports field. Now, it wasn't like the sports field I saw on television last night where the soccer's played with beautiful grass. A piece of dusty land, maybe three sticks on the one side, three sticks on the other. And all they had was a bit of pieces of plastic to cover themselves as the rain was approaching. And a local attorney said, this is impossible. Our constitution guarantees everyone the right of access to adequate housing. He went to court. The high court decided they mustn't resolve this case, attempt to resolve this case under pressure of imminent rains. They realized a very important <coughs> case raising huge jurisprudential questions was involved and so temporary arrangements were made to provide for temporary shelter while the litigation proceeded. The High Court said that the provision requiring uh, granting the right of access to adequate uh, housing is followed by 
a further constitutional provision, and you'll find it in, in the book and in the chapter, that says the state shall take reasonable legislative and other measures progressively to realize the right within its available resources. He said the state was taking reasonable measures progressively to realize the right. At that stage, something like 250,000 homes had been built by the state and given at no cost at all to people to move from their shacks. I might say by now, South Africa has built something like two and a half million brick homes with water, electricity, a bit of land, after some years you can sell on. It's spectacular by international standards in terms of responding to the immediate needs for shelter of desperately poor people. But he said, so the state in general is fulfilling its obligations, but he said there's a provision in the Constitution that says children, every child has the right to shelter. And that's not qualified in terms of progressive measures to realize that right. That's an immediately enforceable right. And he said the 400 children, I'm saying, have to be given shelter. And since children can't be separated from their parents, the parents must get shelter with them. The case came to our court. We knew it was a big one. Everybody knew it was a big one. Uh, I imagine two existential moments coming together. Mrs. Grootboom, lying with her children in the open air, looking up at the sky, at the stars, and saying, why? I want a decent life for my children. I'm not a bad person. All I want is some shelter and protection for them. Why is it that we are sleeping out in the open? And for those of us sitting in our green robes up on the bench, our existential moment, we've been fighting for social and economic rights to be included in the Constitution. They're there now. We're judges. How can we respond to that situation? We were not happy with the granting of shelter on the basis of the children's rights. We felt that was evading the real issue of how do you enforce social and economic rights. We were helped enormously by two uh, NGOs, one the Community Law Center from the University of the Western Cape, and the other a body called the Legal Resources Center. And this is one of those examples we found where the existence of committed legal people working in civil society sections, sectors, is hugely beneficial to the development of the court jurisprudence. Uh, it's applied in relation to restoration of original, uh, Aboriginal native title, to we have a women's law center, we have a center for child rights, uh, and we have a gay and lesbian equality project, it was called now the Equality Project. And each one has brought cases well prepared, well argued, well documented, that have helped us very much in terms of our jurisprudence. And in this case, it was the NGO representative who swung the debate completely and got us to move away from the children's rights to face up to the enforceability. Our court, because we don't have a huge number of cases, we receive maybe 100, 120 petitions a year. We hear maybe 30. But each one of the 30 is a landmark case. We workshop. We go around the table once, twice, three times. I'm sure we had at least five workshops on the Grootboom case. And I think it's fair to say the eventual outcome didn't represent the position that any single judge had at the beginning. And the decision was unanimous. It was written by my colleague, uh, Zach Yacoub. 
but it had the input of everybody. It had his stamp, his authority, his way, modus of presenting, but each one of us had contributed in different ways. And basically there were two streams of thinking. The one was, this is a housing question. We are judges, what do we know about housing? And we have a housing act, and it's a very good housing act. And hundreds of thousands of houses are being built. And it's just very unfortunate that Mrs. Grootboom is low down on the list. But that is inevitable in the circumstances. If you've got huge pressure on the housing list, uh, extensive resources are being given, but it's just not enough. It's going to take time. The other argument was, but there is a right of access to adequate housing in the Constitution given to everybody. It must have some meaning. And in these desperate circumstances, there must be some response. In the end, the court decided the, and let, let me put it to you, what the terminology was that we had to work with. Everyone has the right of access to adequate housing. The state shall take reasonable legislative and other measures progressively to realize the right within its available resources. When I throw out the question to different audiences, some people say progressive realization, available resources. We didn't go for those two criteria. To us, the key word was reasonable. Is the measure reasonable or not? And we looked at the Housing Act. And as far as it went, the Housing Act was reasonable. It did ensure that considerable sums of money would be dedicated towards rehousing desperately poor people from their shacks in housings that weren't wonderful by any means, maybe dormitory areas, but that provided at least a minimum level of dignity and security, a home, a fixed home, a stable home for people to develop their lives. It was not that Mrs. Grootboom as such as an individual was sleeping out in the open but that the Housing Act had no program for people in the situation of Mrs. Grootboom. People in totally desperate circumstances, victims of flood, of fire, of evictions, who had absolutely nowhere at all to go. And we said to the extent that the housing program in a proper statute failed to make provision for emergency situations like that, it was unreasonable. The effect was to require the state to adapt the act to provide in a reasonable measure for people in those circumstances, in circumstances similar to Mrs. Grootboom. We didn't individualize the outcome, the response. We dealt with the measure used by the state, a measure which would include people like her. Uh, I can recall, I think I can, well, I recall, I hope correctly, that Archimedes said, give me a lever and I can lift the world. And quite often we judges, we need a lever, an intellectual lever, conceptual lever. And our lever has been the concept of reasonable measures. And judges are used to dealing with reasonableness in other areas of the law. You can use a reasonable amount of self-defense to repel an attack. It's very contextual, and it has an element of proportionality. We use reasonableness in terms of negligence in measuring was the behavior, the conduct reasonable or not, giving rise to civil damages. Or if it was negligent driving, we use reasonableness a lot. We use reasonableness a lot in administrative law in evaluating the conduct of administrative officials. And now this was applying the concept of reasonableness to the measures being adopted by the state in uh, response to its duty to promote the enjoyment of 
fundamental social and economic rights. And that now became the doctrinal foundation of our approach to the enforcement of social and economic rights. We were urged in that case to adopt a different approach based on a comment from the Economic and Social Rights uh, Committee of the United Nations, which spoke about the duty on the state to provide a minimum core for those most in need in society. And the argument was a minimum core can have a quantitative dimension and people falling below that core can come to court and can sue for an appropriate enforcement of their rights. We didn't reject it outright in that case. We just felt that it wasn't helpful. We didn't know what the minimum core would be. There was no evidence before the court in terms of a minimum core, and we were doubtful about whether our constitution required applying that. About two years later, another very dramatic case came to us. It's called the Treatment Action Campaign case. The TAC was described by its council as one of the, as probably the most uh, prominent and, and successful or significant civil society organization in South Africa. I might say possibly in the world at that particular moment. It consisted of people living with the HIV, with HIV, who were dissatisfied with the response of the state to their situation and who organized themselves as a grassroots organization, membership being based on their claim for enforcement of their rights under the Constitution for access to health care. And the particular case that they brought was based on the provision of a drug, navirapine, uh, to women about to give birth, uh, women living with HIV. The evidence was that navirapine cut the transmission of the virus to the newly born baby by about 50%. The state said the drug is safe, you can buy it over the counter, its effectiveness within that range has been established. But in the state sector, we're going to allow it to be used in only two sites in each of the nine provinces while we gain logistical and administrative experience. That's for two years. In terms of its administration, in terms of the problems of breastfeeding afterwards, transmission and so on, the TAC felt that this was absolutely inappropriate. The doctors throughout the public sector in South Africa were up in arms and saying that we want to counsel the women and if they wish to take the navirapine, then we can provide it to them. And Boehringer were providing the drug free for five years in South Africa. As we were going into the court, my colleague uh, Sandiling Ngobo said to me, Albi, would you like a handkerchief? He was smiling. And that was a private joke between us. I said, Sandiling, no, it's not necessary. The joke emerged from the fact that a year or two earlier, he'd given judgment for the court in a case involving Mr. Hoffman who had applied for a job on South African Airways as a steward. He passed all the tests with flying colors, but it turned out he was HIV positive. South African Airways said, we'll employ you on the ground, but not as a steward. He said, I want to be a steward. And he came to court, he lost in the high court, the case came on appeal to us. And Sandili gave the judgment the court was jam-packed. It was a small room, much, much smaller, about half the size of, of this room, jam-packed with people wearing T-shirts saying HIV positive. Black, white, brown, young, old, male, female, the nation was there. Absolutely dead silence. 
and Sandili on behalf of the unanimous court said the fact that South African Airways was worried that customers might go to British Airways that refused to employ people as stewards if they were living with HIV was kowtowing to public prejudice and allowing the commercial practices of foreign airliners to dictate fundamental rights of South African people. He said the duty of South African Airways was to combat the prejudice. He could serve coffee and do his job as well as anybody else without communicating the disease to anybody else. If his illness reached the stage where he couldn't function anymore, then like any sick person, if the symptoms were there to disable him, then he wouldn't carry on doing it. His zero count happened to be low and there were good chances that he would have another 10 years of, of active service. It was a beautiful judgment by my colleague and dead silence in the court. And we went out through a curtain at the back and cheering started and I cried. The tears just welled up in my eyes, not just because of the impact of HIV in my country, but the feeling that I belong to a court that can defend the fundamental rights of our people. It was overwhelming. It, it, and something we hadn't envisaged when we drafted the Constitution because HIV hadn't hit our country to the extent that it had done. And I told that story when I went to Harvard uh, on a lecture tour and Sandili had done a master's at Harvard and somebody heard it and they told him, L.B. Sachs mentioned this beautiful judgment that you gave and that he cried. So now he's offering me his handkerchief. I say, no, Sandili, it's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared for it today. And Arthur Chaskelson, on behalf of the court, gives the judgment and he says that um, he dealt with the, a strong argument in favor of individual rights based on a minimum core argument. In our judgment, we rejected that. And you'll see some discussion of some of the issues uh, in, my, in the chapter um, that have been raised in the discussions here about competing rights of different people and a question I put to counsel if somebody living up in the mountains claims she has a right to water uh, and the same pipe that reaches her could reach 10,000 people lower down, does that mean she has the same claims as they have that we don't have rationing based on the maximum number of people who can benefit from the treatment. He said that's an emotional argument and I said of course these are emotional issues. It's the nature of what human beings can, can claim. It was a very beautiful interaction between council and, and the bench on the very issues that are being debated here and we rejected that argument. The other argument from the state was judges don't prescribe drugs, medication. And ordinarily we wouldn't do that. And in the Subramani case, we refused to go behind the decision arrived at rationally and fairly by the medical people. But here the basis of the decision to our thinking was clearly unreasonable. The drug cost nothing, the doctors were clamoring. The impact would be to save thousands of children born in the coming years from being born with the HIV virus, to give them a life that they could never have otherwise. Very, very dramatic. And to restrict it in the way that the Ministry of Health was doing was unreasonable. We were asked by counsel for the TAC to order the state to report back within six months, if they found, if we found in their favor, report back in six months what they were doing to roll out the <laughs> antiretrovirals. And we said, we're not going to order the state. Until now, the state has always acceded to uh, our decisions on what the law requires. If after a certain period the state is failing, you can come back to the court and get us to intervene. But we did accept that the court can impose what we call structural interdicts, requiring the state to take certain action to report back within a certain period. But we wouldn't rush into doing that unless it was really required 
by the circumstances. So Arthur Jaskelson reads out the essence, the state is told that its refusal to extend the provision of antiretrovirals to more than two sites in each of the nine provinces was unreasonable. And the court is jam-packed with people wearing T-shirts, HIV positive, black, white, brown, men, women, young, old, dead silence. We go out to the back. The cheering comes again, and I cried again. These are the only cases that have reached our court on the question of the right of access to health. It's very striking hearing the hundreds of thousands of cases heard elsewhere. And uh, in the common law, certainly English-speaking country uh, jurisdictions, our court is seen as bold, adventurous, almost reckless. Here in Costa Rica, we appear to be timid, conservative, almost feeble. I think the answer is th these things are very, very contextual. Uh, the significance of our decision is being discussed and debated by many people, but from then onwards, the state in South Africa began to roll out antiretrovirals. We now have the biggest antiretroviral program in the world. One would expect that we have the highest incidence of HIV in, in quantitative terms in the world. Uh, the Treatment Action Campaign is working very closely with government, and it's a beautiful example of what people, well-organized communities on the ground, can do to facilitate not simply the devising of a medical program, but the implementation of the program. Because implementation depends upon regularity, on confidence, on trust, and it ceases to be simply people being told to go to the clinic the doctor in the white coat listened to them. Sometimes their negative uh, reactions to the to ARVs. Uh, there are all sorts of people coming up with all sorts of home remedies and offering all sorts of traditional medicine remedies and so on. Uh, if it's people in the community saying, it's us, we must go, we must do it, this is the way to do it. They're checking up every day that people are taking the ARVs, it works. And it's had a terrific effect in South Africa. And they're finding now with research that's being done, the transmission of the virus is being cut down very dramatically because of the ARVs. It's not a choice between prevention and ARVs. ARVs become part and parcel of a prevention program. And the whole nation is feeling a little more confident, a little less bereft. Now, it's not because of our decision, but our decision was maybe one element of a court imposing a rational, uh, thought-through, uh, judicial intervention. The issue was very hot in the country. The president was being accused by many people of being in denial about ARV. The Ministry of Justice was accused of being, um, of dragging its heels in circumstances like this. You couldn't have had a hotter potato than that. And we gave our decision as judges uh, and the case transformed, uh, helped, let me say, the case was a very important element in the transformation of the thinking of government uh, with very beneficial outcomes that affected millions of people. We had another case that seemed to be coming our way, and that dealt with the cost of um, expensive imported materials. And the uh, wish of the government to either manufacture locally or import generics at a much, at a, something like 20% of the cost, not just 15% less, 80% less. And this was dramatic in our country. The need for the ARVs was enormous. People were dying. And the cost of the medicines just made it impossible for the government to even contemplate any significant form of, of uh, public distribution. 
this was a case where the government and the TAC were on the same side. And about 18 pharmaceutical companies were defending intellectual property on the other side. We don't choose our cases. Cases come to us. But I must say, I was hoping that the case would be litigated on and would come to us. I felt if ever there was a case of intellectual property uh, as a purely commercial venture uh, without any escape clause in terms of dramatic impact on the lives of millions of people and huge deaths, this was the one. And there was a provision, I think, believe there is a provision in the TRIPS that speaks about emergency situations and that might have been a straight, fairly straightforward textual foundation because if this wasn't an emergency, then what, that what would be? But in fact, the pharmaceutical companies climbed down and maybe they were frightened that a powerful decision from the South African Constitutional Court could have had, had applications elsewhere. And it wasn't as though they were going to lose a lucrative market. The market in Africa, the demand in Africa was enormous but the market was very diminished. We had one case involving, it didn't reach our court, of the rights of prisoners uh, living with HIV to um, get access to antiretrovirals. And a judge, in a very, very carefully, very cautious uh, judgment, just based on the evidence before him in relation to a particular prison, ordered that antiretrovirals be given to the prisoners. And again, this is combating prejudice. Prisoners, very low down in terms of many people in the public. Why should we waste money looking after the health of prisoners? We've got so many other issues. But the prisoners are human beings. The virus strikes people from every class, every element of society. And it was part and parcel of this national response to a national uh, medical calamity. I'm going to just summarize very quickly the way our social and economic rights jurisprudence has developed since then. As I said, we haven't had further cases dealing with uh, the right to health. The main development has been in relation to evictions. And starting with the Grootboom case, but Grootboom case wasn't an eviction case as such, it was people who'd been evicted uh, our constitution says no one shall be evicted from their homes, from their home except by a court order, taking account of all relevant circumstances. And our parliament had passed a law called the Prevention of Illegal Eviction and Unlawful Occupation Act, providing for the way eviction proceedings were to be brought before courts and saying the courts must decide what's just and equitable. Now that's not great guidance to a court. Every taking account of all relevant circumstances and do what's just and equitable. The case we had was about 18 African families had set up their shelters on land owned by wealthy white people next to a very prosperous white suburb, which was vacant land. And the landowners went to the council and said, this is our land. They can't just come there and put up their homes, evict them. And the council went to the high court, and the high court gave a certain measure of time and said, you can't squat on or you can't settle on someone else's land and we give you six months to go. The six months passed, they didn't go. The High Court ordered eviction. It came to us. It was a crisis moment for me. I felt I'd taken an oath to do justice without fear, favor, or prejudice. These people, these families had put up their shacks on somebody else's land. Our constitution doesn't have a direct uh, protection of property rights, but it says no one shall be deprived of their property arbitrarily. And 
this would be an arbitrary deprivation if they could just settle there and the court didn't order eviction. I couldn't see a way around that. But I as Albie, I couldn't do it. I knew historically why people put up their shacks on land like that. In South Africa, 87% uh, of the land by law was reserved for whites only, by law. Black people were allowed to come to the urban areas on permits, forced to live in locations. They had no access to land. They were a migrant labor population. I couldn't do it. I thought I might have to resign from the court. Fortunately, I was able to convert a personal crisis into an intellectual dilemma. Because the same constitution that protected people from arbitrary deprivation of property protected people from being evicted. And now in terms of the statute, unless it was just and equitable. But what's just and equitable? Just and equitable to move Desperately poor people of land that's not being used for anything else. They've got nowhere else to go. Just and equitable to allow people to come and put up their shacks on your land. And the judgment which I wrote for the court said there are some cases that are not capable of a correct answer. I got that from the German Constitutional Court, the second chamber in the abortion case, where the minority decision said that. The competing interests are so powerful, you can't give a correct answer. There's no right answer. So you give the best answer you can to reconcile the competing principles. And in this case, the best answer would have been, I argued and I, I, I held in that case, a form of mediation. Unless the parties had been brought together, together and given an opportunity to try and work out between themselves through mediation what to do, it would not be just and equitable for the court to expel them. The case dealt with this theme of Ubuntu, which I mentioned earlier on. I am a person because you're a person. I can't separate my humanity from acknowledgement of your humanity. That the fact that people Millions of people were living as homeless people in our country. It wasn't just an assault to their dignity. It was an assault to the dignity of everybody. A country with great resources. I could feel the indignity as a human being, as a person, as a judge, that my fellow human beings and citizens are living in terrible conditions like that. And we had to find a response that was based on principles like that. The ordinary technical provisions of land law were not adequate. We had to look at land law in terms of our history, in terms of the rights of people not to be expelled from their homes unless it's just and equitable to do so. It required a whole new judicial role, a judicial role of supervising very uh, crisis-ridden social situations. It wasn't the judge simply saying right, wrong. The right is with you, get out, or the right is with them, pay damages, whatever it might be. It was a new function for the judiciary. And in a later case, my colleague Zach Yacoub picked up on a phrase that I'd used, but I hadn't given a saliency to, uh, of meaningful engagement between the parties involving mediation. And he saw the power of meaningful engagement. And in the next eviction case that we had, the court decided that it would not be just and equitable to order an eviction unless there'd been meaningful engagement between to some hundreds of occupants of uh, now derelict high-rise buildings in the center of Johannesburg, uh, with the water cut off, the electricity cut off, the refuse that collected, they were rat traps, they were dangerous, and the council wanted to evict them to upgrade the area. 
And they said, we don't mind leaving, but we have nowhere else to go. The council said, you can go 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers outside Johannesburg. There's land there. They said, our children are at school here. Our jobs are here. The thinking that we had, but we didn't lay that down as a ruling. We got the parties to engage with each other. And it was a huge educational process for the council people, the bureaucrats, who simply saw these poor people as problems in the way to beautifying the city, to upgrading the city, and developing the city, and getting tax revenue for the housing of the poor and all the rest. And it gave a sense of civic dignity to the poor, that they could speak in their own voices, that they were somebody, not an anonymous mass, and that the civic responsibility of the council wasn't simply to beautify the buildings and get rid of these death traps. It was also to look after the poor people within its area of jurisdiction and to recognize them as citizens of their particular area. And so it became part of an educational program, required program for all bureaucrats in the housing department uh, throughout the country. Uh, then we required them to report back to us, and by then they had reached an agreement uh, with the civil society organizations helping the poor, the, the poor people, uh, to achieve a beneficial sort of outcome. And that theme of reasonable engagement now has become the foundation of all our eviction matters, and I believe it has a potential that goes beyond simply evictions. It's the theme of these difficult social economic cases where it's not a question of who's right and who's wrong, but how best to resolve competing claims in certain circumstances. And it can bring in experts, third parties and others. Uh, it does require the parties to look into each other's eyes and to try and work out solutions themselves. It's not quite the same as having an expert tribunal to whom you can refer, but it, it's not, not dissimilar. And you're not going to find the answer in a meaning of the word, how to define a particular word, how to define the right to health or the right to housing. And you can't do it through purely definitional argument and reasoning. It's heavily contextual, uh, and the way forward is really through the people most directly involved to engage with each other. So in conclusion, I'll just mention the last three cases that I heard as a judge. One dealt with um, the right of access to water, and we refused to accept the claim that people had a right to more water than was given, being given. In other words, our court didn't follow the metric approach. Uh, should it be 42 kiloliters? Per week, should it be 50, should it be 47? The other courts had given different amounts. The amount being supplied was above the National Water Act minimum, uh, and it had substantially above that. The claim was it should be even more than that, and we said we're not going to say that the measure is unreasonable. Uh, we were very unpopular with the human rights community, but we felt we didn't want to be drawn into measuring. Uh, another case dealt with pit latrines, the very last case I had, uh, and people in a desperately poor community claiming that the pit latrines that they had, they were concrete pit latrines, and they wanted VIPs. A VIP was a vent vent ventilated improved pit latrine uh, that was much more expensive. And the argument was that Soon, the whole area was going to be redeveloped, and it just wasn't cost-effective to spend money on VIPs. And that was the argument we upheld eventually. And I thought maybe only in South Africa can the quality of pit latrines reach the highest court. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe in Latin America, exactly that kind of case can come. But I, I mention these other cases to say that there isn't a preoccupation with uh, medicines. Uh, the focus isn't on medicines. It hasn't been on that at all. But the preoccupation is very much with the poorest of the poor, the most desperate. And they are the people 
aided by uh, civil society organizations and NGOs who are bringing very, very well motivated, well argued cases to the court. We have quite a rich jurisprudence now. It's being taught at the universities. Uh, the lawyers are becoming familiar with it. It's becoming part and parcel of our uh, daily bread, if you like. So what conclusions do I offer in terms of uh, Latin America? Uh, I think these themes are extremely context-related. Uh, I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't presume to say that South African experience is uh, the way forward for Latin America, as I wouldn't say Latin American experience is the way forward for us. I would say we've got to study what you're doing, and maybe you can study what we're doing. If you find something useful in our approach, it might help you in your own debates. And certainly I've learned an enormous amount here that's been absolutely eye-opening for me. For a long time, we were so lonely out there, we thought we were completely on our, on our own. Now we perhaps being left behind uh, in, in a number of respects. And it might be interesting to even compare why we've gone in different directions. And to some extent, it's based on the text of our constitution. Uh, to some extent, on the fact that we are building up precedent. Each case is foundational. It's binding on all other courts. It becomes immediately operational in terms of the bureaucracy uh, and the administration can be applied in, in that particular way. What do I feel could be transportable? The emphasis on the indivisibility of rights and the human dignity dimension, strongly stressed in Grootboom. The quantitative argument was not enough. The state is fulfilling its functions by providing hundreds of thousands of houses. In terms of people desperately poor, it's not just the homeless. We have millions of people who are homeless. These are almost like the homeless homeless, with nothing at all. There's a qualitative dimension. Their dignity were, was being plunged below something tolerable in a society like our society with all its limitations and problems. In the case of the Treatment Action Campaign case, uh, I, I said to counsel at one stage, hoping for a settlement, I said, imagine the position of the woman about to give birth. One of life's most beautiful, wonderful acts giving birth to a child. And she knows that if she takes that one drop and the child's given a drop afterwards, that child that she's giving birth to has so much greater chance of having an enjoyable and wonderful life. Uh, isn't it possible to talk? Surely the Ministry of Health can't be against. Had a break, council came back and said, judges don't prescribe prescribed drugs, that, that, that was the end of that. Uh, but one can see that in that case, it was impacting on human dignity, human life, in a profound way that went beyond simply the right to health in a broad sense. And so the court intervened. And we got great public support in that case for that particular intervention. The second area that I think is possibly transportable is the that theme of meaningful engagement as an alternative to judges simply dis deciding who's right and wrong, supervising a process uh, in which the parties most affected can try and argue it out with themselves. The judges giving an indication of the themes and elements that they feel are profoundly important from a constitutional point of view. Um, and thirdly, possibly, the wide powers that our court has given by our constitution to declare provisions to be unconstitutional, but to give parliament a period to rectify the defect, uh, to do anything that's just and equitable. Our powers, those powers are included there. And sometimes if the powers are limited simply to a very narrow menu, you win or you lose. If you win, you get everything. If you lose, you get nothing. Um, 
maybe it, it distorts the outcomes beyond uh, a sustainable way, a uh, sustainable uh, a measure that, that could be sustainable. In any event, can I just conclude by saying that uh, I'm, I'm very uh, inspired and encouraged by the quality of, of the discussion, by the uh, commitment of the judges to social and economic rights. Uh, the, it's based ultimately on values that you have, not just on technical language in constitutions and provisions. Many provisions in the states, the United States, have rights to health and rights to education and so on, but it just hasn't been developed there, and the judiciary uh, has looked askance at the idea of social and economic rights. I'm sure it's related to the post-dictatorship feeling of wanting the nation to emerge as a nation embodying everybody, all the people who'd suffered, all the people trying to achieve dignity. Certainly in our case, that element of dignity, of citizenship, is so strongly, and I haven't heard it mentioned today, it's not just a right to be healthy so that you can work, so that you can enjoy life, so that you can vote. It's to feel that you count, that you matter in the society, that your pain is the same as the pain of somebody who's rich or wealthy, or whatever it might be, that your tooth that's hurting or your child that's suffering is entitled to that same response from society because you matter. And as we said in the Kruitboom case, the social and economic rights are social and economic rights, they also gender rights. It's women who bear the burden disproportionately of the lack of proportionate distribution of resources uh, in our country, and it's a racial question in our country as well. And we'll never have a nation, uh, a proper nation, and a true sense of, of moral participatory citizenship until the rights, social and economic rights, uh, guaranteed in our constitution are really enjoyed on a massive scale, where rationing doesn't mean people doing without anything at all in desperate circumstances, where rationing is really how far can you push the limits of what's available. At the moment, uh, the rationing can be very, very harsh because we just don't have the resources uh, that people need, and you can't refuse to give anything to anybody because you can't give every, everything to everybody. Thank you.